Good afternoon. Come on, I know we had lunch and we're full, but come on, we could do a little better than that. Good afternoon. Uh, that's better. Okay, my name is Z Felicia Jordan, and I am, uh, well, I'm getting my new job title. I am the Director of Social Security Representative Pay E Program at Disability Rights Florida. And in my former uh, position, I was a staff attorney on the advocacy, education, and outreach team at Disability Rights Florida. So what we're gonna be going into is some things that we work on today. Disability Rights Florida is basically the protection and advocacy agency for the state of Florida. We advocate and, lit and litigate on behalf of individuals with disabilities. And one of the things that we do is with those different projects that we do uh, perform, we do not charge our clients fees. So all you have to do is be an individual with a disability. So we do not care where you live in the state, as long as you're a resident of Florida. Uh, we do not have an age guidelines. We do not have an income guideline. All you have to be is an individual with a disability. So um, I will give you our contact information toward the end of the presentation. So that way all it is is you can either call us or uh, we're online. We have a website, Twitter. Facebook, you know, uh, so that way you can reach out and if you do need assistance or you want us to come out and do some outreach, uh, we'd be more than happy to do that. We don't care where you are in the state, we go where the cases are. So it's not a situation where, okay, I live in the panhandle, can't, I don't think anybody can help me. Yes, we can, um, depending on what that type of case is and what the need is and if it's based on that individual's disability. Okay, so what we're going to do is go in today is some, some of the learning objectives. So what we wanted to focus as we have at Disability Rights Florida is transition services. That crucial age from 17 to 26 years old. This is a very, very tricky, tricky time for an individual and especially the population that you guys work with because there's a lot of challenges and a lot of different pieces that you guys are putting together to try to make sure that that young adult has the best start possible. And as I, th I know that you guys have to face a lot of challenges and I appreciate all of what you do in regards to helping this age group in regards to making sure that they have a, a, a best start to their adulthood. Um, we're also going to be talking about priority issues, what to look for for the school to work transition if the individual is receiving SSI and SSDI benefits. And we're also going to be looking at resources to help uh, potentially manage transition issues. So. We had that individual, they turned in 18. Yay, 18. Okay, now what? So yes, this person at this point in time can legally make their decisions. And that's the scary part. Um, but at the same time, if we work with them and try to help them with their services that they need to transition, that'd be the best opportunity they have in order to go to that next step. So we're going to help with the education and training. We're going to help with employment. We're going to help with community experiences because that's going to be the important thing for them to be able to transition from childhood to adulthood. So what we look at is that basically by age 16, students are covered by IDEA. So as in Florida, as age 14, what we do is we ask uh, during IEP meetings, we want them to start doing what they call the transition individualized educational plan. And what that is designed is they're supposed to be looking at result oriented processes and they focus on the academics and the functional achievement of the student. They want to facilitate what we're doing after we leave high school. Now under IDEA, a student can be available if they're a student with a disability and they have an IEP and they need specially designed instruction, they can stay into the school system until age 22. And I hear people like, oh no, they told me once they're 18, they're out. No, they're not. They can, if they need specially designed instruction, whatever that may be, and that could be life skills, that could be uh, self-advocacy, whatever those things look like to that individual need of that student, that is what they're allowed to have and the school district is responsible to provide that for that individual. So what we try to do is basically look at those things on that um, transition IEP. We're looking at, okay, what are they gonna do once they leave high school? Are they gonna go to post-secondary education? Are they gonna go for vocational education? Are we gonna look at supportive employment? Because if they, you know, functions 
They're not going to be able to go to vocational uh, uh, education or a post-secondary educational setting. What can they do in order for them to start working? Um, what can we do regarding adult services? What can we do about them living independently? What skills do they have? Do they know how to do laundry? Um, how do we go about doing that? Believe it or not, in some school districts, they do teach individuals home skills, how to do their own laundry, how to do shopping, how to do a budget. And some of those things, if your individual student need it, that is the place where we need to talk and bring it to the table at an IEP meeting. Okay, so what does this transition process encompass? So we're like basically looking at that childhood to adulthood type of situation. We want them to be as independently as possible, both socially and financially. We're looking at IDEA services, because here's the thing, a lot of people don't know. Once you leave high school, IDEA stops. Section 504 may cover you if you're in a college or a vocational education after high school, but it is not as individualized or all-encompassing as the regular school district uh, procedure is. And then we got to look at turning that 18 years old, will it impl basically implicate their, their Social Security benefits and their health care benefits? So we also have to look at those things. So we look at it, and we should cover their goals. What do they want to do? Now, I see sometimes in transition IEPs, and it breaks my heart because sometimes they'll say, they'll wait till the student turns 22 years old and it's right before they leave high school, and like, oh, Johnny wants to go to college. College to do what? What is his abilities? What is his functions? How do we get him there? Let's look at that. But nobody else did until six months before he graduates high school. And that's part of the issue that we want to have to address. So we're also looking at what needs they're going to have. Um, where are they going to stay in the community? Are they going to stay in the community? Um, how are they going to stay in the community? What employment plan are they going to have in place? And we're also going to look at vocational rehabilitation agencies and other governmental services, what they can bring to the table. We have all of those people that can participate in that IEP meeting to make sure that it is a circle of coverage in regards to that young adult or soon-to-be young adult. Yes? Whose responsibility is it to make sure that the um, folks we have, folks attend the IEP? There is a memo that was done on January 2016 that was signed by, at that time, the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation's director, uh, the Division of Blind Services uh, executive director, as well as the uh, Bureau Chief for Special Education for the Florida Department of Education. And in that particular memo, it states that within three days of them be the school district inviting them to a meeting, they either have to show up in person, over the phone, or via email, basically describing the services that would be provided to that student and given that option. So basically, if the, student, if the school invites them, they shall come. <laughs> So that's the other issue we have. And what we like to do is have them come at age 14 and start at age 14. They'll tell you, oh, it's too early. We're going to wait till age 22. Malarkey. Um, basically, based on that memo, as well as federal regulations, they're supposed to start at 14. Um, we'll get into it a little uh, later in regards to WIOA, but basically that is what the standard is. Um, it is available online, but if not, I can, you know. No problem. Great. Okay, so who provides these services? So the schools and vocational rehabilitations are both required to provide transition services. And basically, this is like the regulations regarding it. And the IEP, this is going to get confusing, but work with me. The IEP is the educational plan that's done at, by the school, and the individual plan for employment, otherwise known as the IPE, is basically done by vocational rehabilitation services. So there's two different plans that basically kind of both encompass what the transition situation would be for that young person. Okay, so transition services, basically we're looking at, um, again, post-secondary education, vocational training, um, if it's supported employment, those type of things, independent living, community participation. And we're looking at those things regarding their preferences, their interests, instruction if it's needed, community experiences. We're going to develop their employment and post-adult living objectives. So they may have what they call community-based instruction. So even while they're in high school, they can have job experiences. 
so they can go to, you know, basically a lot of schools uh, set it up in regards to uh, community-based instruction where they can learn how to do certain things or do tryouts to see what their interests are and see if that's something they want to do. I had a client that basically was very interested in becoming a firefighter. And the school was just like, yeah, but what do we do with that? And I'm like, did you ever decide, you know, think about the Explorer program? And I was like, what's that? And I was like, the Explorer program that was formerly under the Boy Scouts basically have, uh, you know, situations where young adults can work with firefighters. They have groups and they, firefighters, law enforcement officers, uh, EMTs, and basically they work with them and work in the field with them as an explorer. And they get that real life experience to see what it's like and see if that's something they really, really want to do. Oh, yes. I think most, it depends. Um, I don't think they do in regards to accommodations for disabilities because we, we have to look at the ADA component of it. Um, but at the same time, they would have to look at the functionality and the needs and the abilities of that individual person. Okay, so these are gonna include our guidance and counseling, our on-the-job training experiences. We're gonna look at vocational training programs, including college. We're gonna look at AT devices. That's important because sometimes we'll get a situation where they have to battle who pays for the AT. And that's the other thing. Sometimes people, you know, with individuals, if they have that assistive technology, they can do so many more things if they have means to be able to do whatever they need to do in life. Um, so, you know, I used to have some students that were, the school considered them behaviorally challenged. And it was only because they did not have a means of communication. And once they were able to have a means of communication with assistive uh, technology device, it made all the difference. Same thing with reading. Um, we would have a student that basically would consider be behaviorally challenged, and it was task avoidance. They did not want to be considered, quote unquote, the dumb kid. They'd rather be considered the bad kid. So they would act out when it was time to do reading because they didn't want any their peers to know that they had trouble with reading. So once they had certain devices and certain tutoring and their reading improved, it made all the difference in the world. Okay, so I got some transition case law here. Um, basically in regards to uh, lack of assessments, in regards to considering uh, students with transition, that if they don't do it, it's denial of a free and appropriate public education under IDEA. Uh, we also have um, other information in regards to, you know, administrative law judges' rulings on these. So I just slipped that in there um, for us to be able to look at. Um, vocational rehabilitation services. So VR, uh, a lot of people have not really heard of it. This is an agency that's been around. Um, basically, uh, it's, uh, a, the person is eligible if that person has a disability and requires vocational rehabilitation services to prepare, enter, or retain gainful employment. That's only a requirement. Say, with blind services, this is the statutory requirement, not necessarily the um, administrative code requirement, but providing service to, to an individual who is blind and they have a central acuity of 2200 or less in a better eye. Uh, so this is basically the requirement for qualification under the Division of Blind Services. This is a different agency, but it provides a lot of similar services to vocational rehabilitation. But these are for individuals who would meet that criteria in regards to their visual impairment. Okay, how do we get it? So what I did was I left a little link in here. So basically, one of them, the top one is for VR, and basically it's a link to their application service in regards to a referral. You can self-refer. You do not have to wait for a school district or anybody else. You can self-refer an individual for VR services. Okay, um, DBS, I also sent the link for you to apply for that. Okay, so you can submit an application online or they have like the PDFs that you could submit and submit it to them as well. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the application will be designated to a counselor once you apply. And basically at that point, we as Disability Rights Florida also help with supervised referrals. And what does that mean? You could call us and we can submit those for you. Kind of the white glove service, so to speak. <laughs> So we could be able to do that for you and help you with the initial meeting. If that's a situation that you're unsure of what that entails, we have very, very good expert 
advocates that are content experts that will be able to assist you in that process. So they look at eligibility. Now this is uh, something that we had had issues with and um, hopefully now they're being corrected, but in regards to determination for eligibility, so within 60 days of you applying, right, they're supposed to be able to find out whether or not you're eligible. They can ask that individual for an extension of time, but it has to be a consent to them to extend it. It's supposed to be done within 60 days or less. Um, also, the person has to have a, a legal status to work in the United States. So long as they have a legal status to work in the United States, they can still be eligible for VR services. That includes green cards and, and, and the like. Okay, eligible disabilities. If it's mental health, if it's chemical dependency, is an adjustment disorders, intellectual disabilities, uh, learning disabilities, speech, hearing, and vision impairment. So sometimes we even have individuals who are both clients of VR and DBS because they can both get services, uh, compatible services from both agencies due to their disabilities if they have a visual impairment as well. Um, Florida has what we call a order of selection and what we do is they have three categories, one, two, and three, most significant, significant, and an individual disability. So right now, categories one and two are wide open, and three they've been going into pretty quickly. So they, you know, if they don't have enough for everybody, then they basically um, will try to do that. I urge people, um, yes, apply, apply, apply. See if you're eligible. Don't, in my urgency, um, you know, Try it and see if it, see that individual is eligible. See if that student that you're working with is eligible. Because um, I'd rather you you know they deny you and we can appeal that <laughs> versus uh, you know no one ever trying. Um, in regard to that also uh, disability, they're looking at situations that will be uh, the limitations. So they're looking at functionality. If it's late, wait listed while in school, then the VR counselor will basically make sure that they see where they are on the category of one, two, or three before they leave. And they're looking at functional capabilities, moving, communicating, self-care, uh, self-direction, interpersonal skills, work tolerance, and work skills. And this is what they provide, counseling and guidance. Each person will be assigned a counselor. They have vocational counselors. Um, they have training programs. So if there's a program, not necessarily college, uh, we have students sometimes with intellectual disabilities and they're really good with animals. And they want to basically work with animals and they have this voc uh, veterinarian technician type of program that fits within their skill set and it's something that they're really interested in doing. And it's a program that VR can pay for. And they can work for a veterinarian and basically endure shelters or things like that and basically kind of earn a competitive wage in doing something they enjoy. Um, physical restoration uh, in regards to uh, prosthetics and the like. Uh, mental restoration, they will help you with uh, uh, mental health counselors and therapists and psychiatrists and psychologists. Um, supported employment, sometimes there is a situation where somebody needs a job coach. They provide and assist with that process. Um, employment services, they also help with occupational license and tools, equipment. Um, we've helped people even with uh, nursing degrees uh, to get their nursing license or an individual who just had uh, worked as a mechanic and needed certain tools in order to obtain employment, they pay for those things. Um, prosthetics and orthotics, they pay for rehabilitation technology. Sometimes people need a reader for a computer or something like that, or dragon in order to make uh, speech to text happen for them to be able to work a job. Those things they can assist with. Interpreter services, or sometimes if somebody needs ASL, they'll be able to assist in that process. Self-employment, a lot of people don't think about that. Start their own business, what? They do help with that. They have a um, what they call a, CBAT, a CBTAC, which basically is an individual that helps them create a business plan and look at the job, um, the, 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 the business market, and see the viability of that business. And they also assist them in regards to that business. Um, and they also do community-based work experiences. So this is like a good resource for VR just there waiting for you guys because if they don't have the money, they gotta send it back. So let's use it. <laughs> um, 
So individualized plan of employment. So basically, this is that plan that I told you about. There's a written document basically in regards to their services and what they need for their employment outcome. So on the top of the page, they're gonna say, Johnny wants to be uh, an EMT. And we're gonna do this, 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 and this, and this for Johnny to be an EMT. And then they're gonna outline who pays for what. So if he's doing a training program, tuition will be paid for vocational rehabilitation. And counseling will be paid for by vocational rehabilitation. And this will be provided by vocational rehabilitation. But however, this will be responsible for, Johnny will be responsible to do this. And they have that, and it's supposed to be renewed every single year in order to update what's going on with Johnny or if there's a significant change. So um, basically, if there's a student with a disability, they have to be coordinated with the IEP. And that's why I said the three-day situation with that memo, because that way, both of those things have to work together. The left hand can't know what the right hand's doing and vice versa. They're supposed to work together in order to help this transition age student move on to the next level. So time frames. This is important because we've had cases uh, where people were like, wait a minute, I've been waiting for a year and nobody got back to me for an IPE. No, that's not supposed to happen. So each agency has uh, their own policy as well as uh, statute and, and administrative code where they have timelines. So DBS has 60 days from time of eligibility so you had 60 days from when you applied to find you eligible. Then they have 60 days from when they find you eligible to make sure you have IPE with your plan in place. VR has similar 60 days to find that you're eligible, but 90 days to develop your IPE. Okay, so let's get into the little social security part. Ticket to work program. So, Social Security beneficiaries who are age 18 to 64 may receive employment-related services under the Ticket to Work program. This is one of the work incentives that Social Security has for individuals who receive Social Security benefits. And this is both for people who receive, I know this is gonna get confusing, bear with me, SSI, which is Supplemental Security Income. This is the one that's more income-based. It's more for the people who do not have the 40 credits to be insured, or they do not have a relative um, that has a um, record that they can basically deem under. Um, also SSDI, which is the Social Security Disability Insurance, that's the, good, the other one that I said that you have to be insured with the 40 credits or have a relative or an individual of which you can have um, a record that you can be deemed under. So let's get back to Ticket to Work program. It is not a physical document. I know people are like, I didn't get a ticket is not a physical document, it's an electronic, you'll get an electronic letter saying that you had that. But it's basically you giving consent to what we call an EN or an employment network in order for them to be able to help you find employment. So why would we do that? So it, it basically, see if you can work on a sustained level. So while VR is doing all of this wonderful stuff to help this person get training and to see if they could find a job, they would also be reimbursed by Social Security uh, once they, that client receive, works at a sustained level. It also protects the individual from continuing disability reviews while they're working and going to school. So it lasts for approximately about three years. And you know what I mean, what is continuing disability reviews? We're gonna go into that in a second. <laughs> um, but we also have other work incentive programs. And these basically are transitioning from being on benefits to sustained working. And we have a lot of resources. In fact, one of my coworkers, hi. <laughs> hi, Natalie. Um, basically work, works with people to basically have that, and that was one of her past lives, uh, basically help that, uh, that incentive in order to have that coordination of effort. So some people are like, look, you know, SSI is only this amount of money per month. I can't live off of this. I want to be able to work. I want to do something productive. I want to, you know, do something more. How do I go about doing it? Well, we have these offices, what we call work incentive uh, um, programs, and basically we call them WIPAs. And basically in WIPAs, we have four sites, and these are the name of the organizations, and you can coordinate those type of incentives with that WIPA so you can see, okay, how much, if I do X, how does Y result before it's help you plan it. So that before, you know, so some people unfortunately they'll work and don't understand the process and it's like, oh, I lost my benefits. 
or I lost my benefits and my Medicaid. And they're like, how did that happen? I don't know what happened. Nobody told me. No, you know, This one, you can plan it beforehand. So that way you can kind of know what the outcome will be with that individual as you're going along and you're planning this process. Okay, so with Social Security, they allow ben beneficiaries to try to work without losing benefits. You get nine months to try. This is not consecutive. This is in a 60 month period. So you can do it like April and September and then next July. So it's within those, that nine months and they're looking at that threshold of amount of money that you earn. So if you're making more than $880 a month, you're meeting what they call, they call substantial gainful activity and it triggers that month. So if you're making less than that, it may not trigger for that month. If you're getting SSDI or SSI, but at the same time, it'll pop up. So in April, you made $1,000, it'll pop up. In July, it'll pop up. So if you get nine of those, then they're like, oh, well, you may be able to work on a sustained basis. We'll see. And they'll see and review whether or not you can do that. Um, we also have an extended period of eligibility. So once you exhausted all your trial work period, you finished all your nine months, there's a three-year period where you can still obtain benefits if you don't earn more than that substantial gainful activity. So if you're basically you know, making less than that $1,220 for individuals who are disability are disabled, but if you're blind, it's $2,040. So if you, as long as you're making under that amount, um, you could basically re-enter the benefit system without reapplying within that 36 month period. So you have three years after that, that you tried it out, something happened, you got you know worse or something, circumstances changed and you couldn't sustain work, you could basically let Social Security know, hey, I need to, I'm still eligible, I need to go back in, um, and that way you don't have to go through the reapplication process all over again. How many people know how long the application process lasts with Social Security if you tried to, had anybody help apply for benefits? Show of hands. So you know how long it takes. So this is one of the areas that you want to look at to see whether or not that individual will still be eligible and that way they can try to uh, um, re-enter the benefit pay status without having to reapply. We also look at expenses. So it's not just so much as you earn, it's looking at how much it costs you to work. So that's the other thing about it. So you basically have that, um, that dollar amount that we looked at before, that 1220, and then we look at if it costs you money to be able to go to work. So some people may have tools or special things that they need or you know certain equipment or a certain dietary thing they have to do in order just to sustain work. And Social Security will look at that and lower that amount. So if you're making over that substantial gain for activity at 1220 and then you turn around and basically have expenses that impact that amount of money that you're earning, it will bring it down. So you always look at those things and look at those areas to see whether or not that person can stay in pay status or they're over. I know it sounds really complex, but I'm just trying to give you guys a, a brief overview so that way you can kind of gauge what you're doing as you're doing it. Um, subsidies. They also look at the actual value of that work. So if an individual is using a job coach, that's another expense that Social Security look at to, to see whether or not they actually made substantial gainful activity or not, because again, that may bring it down because of the cost of the job coach, no matter who pays for them. So they'll subtract, uh, subtract it from the earned income and look at whether or not that is that substantial gainful activity. So in April, if Johnny is making that 1220, and they're using a job coach, it may bring it down and then not trigger that, that trial work period uh, time. Okay, continuation of Medicare. So after that trial work period, if that beneficiary is still disabled, lose benefits because they made more than substantial gain of activity, uh, they can basically have Medicare Part A and continue for a minimum of 93 consecutive months, seven years and nine months. So this is Medicare, not Medicaid, Medicare. Okay, so we're looking at SSI now. So this is probably more in your population if the person had, didn't receive benefits from their parents. So we're looking at where they take off money. So what they do is they take off $65 off the top. That's the earned income exclusion. But we also gotta look at if they're a student. So if they're a student, they can earn up to $18.70 a month 
and basically still not meet the criteria for substantial gainful activity. They won't trigger that trial work period. So that's something to look at. Um, we looked at the expenses again, and again, we talked about that, so I don't have to go there. Okay, so if Arnold is receiving Social Security benefits, and he's working at Tri-County Sheltered Workshop, and he's receiving an average of $425 per month, is he still eligible for benefits? Yep, he is. He's not working with me today. All right, so what about Arnold now? He's working at the local Motel 6, and he's earning the same income. Would he be eligible for benefits? Yes, he will. It may lower his SSI because of the earned income, depending on how it, we look at certain things, but he would still be under that SGA amount. Past program. This is when I told you about the uh, self-employment. Social Security also assists in that process. So if somebody wants to basically start their own business, and a lot of people with different disabilities do, um, if they want to do that instead of working in a conventional employment situation, they can set aside other income to pursue that work goal. And basically, they could become, and it will reduce or eliminate their Social Security benefits. So they could set aside money um, as they're starting this business and as this income coming in in order for them to be able to, to start their business. If they're getting SSI, what they do is they become SSI um, eligible and the SSDI funds basically is set aside in their past plan and they could create that business. And it has to be done through Social Security with their guidelines and permissions um, because you have to set it up. Um, if it's not set up, it becomes a problem. Um, I had a case where an individual had a past plan, and unfortunately his um, counselor for that past plan retired. And when he retired, he took off for a month before his retirement date <laughs> and didn't leave all the information for the new person that was taking his place. And some of the receipts that he had, they didn't find it, and they're like, oh, we need this for the past plan. If not, we got to charge you because you had made over SGA and everything else. Well, fortunately for him, we were able to reconstruct all of his receipts and show that it was, in fact, for the businesses and the expenses that he had for the businesses, and it was enough to basically keep him under the past plan status. Expedited reinstatement. So this is an incentive that if the benefits are lost through making SGA, within five years they can be reinstated if they no longer can work, and this is without a new application. And this is for both SSI and SSDI. All right, so let's get into WIOA, or, you know. So basically, when we're looking at this, this was signed into law in 2014, and basically it's um, two sections. It's uh, the voc care, voc Rehabilitation Regulations as well as the Client's Assistance Program. And you're like, what in the heck is a Client's Assistance Program? Well, Disability Rights Florida houses the Client Assistance Program for the state of Florida. So we have advocates and attorneys that will be able to help you in situations with vocational rehabilitation or the Division of Blind Services uh, under the umbrella of Disability Rights Florida. We're considered also the cap of the state. So we basically go in, we're looking at the regulations as they come in, we're looking at um, you know, mediations, we're looking at whatever it is that we need to do in order to make the consumers under vocational rehabilitation and, and Division of Blind Services uh, assist them in their process through the navigating the whole process of becoming employed. So, under this WIOA, what does that mean? It's an increased services to youth. They're focusing on young people. They're focusing on your clients. They're focusing on the transition student from 14 to 26. And we're basically making sure not just jobs, but good jobs and careers. And they're basically letting them learn why they earn. So they basically have that accountability that they have to do. So what does that mean? Job exploration counseling. So rather than just having somebody go to a sheltered workshop, before they do that, they have to make sure that whether or not that person can work competitive employment. And they have tryouts. And they have to check every year whether or not that person gains skills so they the work in a competitive employment. Um, we're looking at work-based learning experiences in school, after school, whatever setting that it can be, counseling in regards to stuff, um, in regards to post-secondary education, helping them with learning about college and what that's about, or vocational uh, schools and what that's about. And we're also doing workplace re readiness training, social skills, 
not just learning how to work, but how to interact with individuals. There are programs out there that, you know, they, they charge for it, but they do have social skill training for individuals with certain type of disabilities in order to help them navigate um, life, as well as independent living. And VR and DBS can pay for those. Even peer mentoring, they can do that. So all they have to do is be a youth with a disability, meaning that they're between 14 to 24 years old. There's no potentially eligible. They have to start the eligibility process at age 14. What age are we supposed to start this? 14. <laughs> Here's the thing. 15% of each state's budget has to be used for those services. If they don't use it, they have to give it all back. So let's help them out, people. Let's help them. Okay, so basically they have to do that. If they don't do it, they are required to give it back to the federal government. So we want to help them. Um, and it basically also, uh, we're looking at those projected post-school outcomes. So they're supposed to be actively participating through this process, not just when they're nearing graduation. They're supposed to be starting at age 14. Okay, so they're expected to provide services while they're still in school. And also, they have to promote or facilitate the achievement of an employment outcome. So we're looking at where does Johnny want to be? What does Johnny want to do? And we have to all, you know, we have to look at it practically because if, you know, depending on the functional level of Johnny and Johnny's saying, I want to be Superman, that may not be achievable. But if Johnny's saying, I want to be a veterinarian tech, I like working with animals. Or I want to be a prep cook, I like working with food. Um, even some cases, believe it or not, they pay for, we'll go into it a little later, but they do pay for um, graduate degrees. So somebody saying, I want to go to medical school, or I want to go to law school, or I want a master's degree, VR pays for those things too. Okay? Um, so the congressional intent for WIOA is to increase the most vulnerable workers, low income and youth with limited skills, and we want to give them skills and work opportunities. And that's what they, they want to have to do and, and have partners into doing that. And so basically, this is a section of WIOA saying that it has to be customized employment. And they're encouraging training in sciences, technology, engineering, mathematics, medicine, law, business. I've, I've, I've um, pursued it for individuals to go to law school. I pursued other graduate degree programs. It can be done. So if that individual has that aspiration, it can be done, and vocational rehabilitation can assist. Okay, minimum use on minimum wage. Uh, so one of the things that they like to try to do is try to make sure that all individuals are receiving at least competitive employment. One of the things that we look at is you know, some um, sheltered workshops or 14 uh, Cs, basically individuals making less than minimum wage. And that could be problematic in regards to them ever having to fill their maximum possibility. And so what they're trying to do is integrate and move people from that particular environment to at least try to get them in competitive employment as much as possible. So at least trying to get uh, at least minimum wage as much as possible. SSI re-terminations. So these happen. At age 18, they're going to do a review to determine whether or not the condition or illness meets Social Security Administration definition of a disability for an adult. So, a lot of people don't know, there's two different listings with Social Security. There's a child listing and an adult listing. And what happens is with the child listing, they have different parts of systems of the body, and they're looking for specified things in regards to whether or not they consider that individual to be disabled. The child standard is one thing, and the adult standard basically is totally different. So we have to compare those two. When they turn 18, they're basically going to move from one type to the other. So one thing that would have made them disabled as a child may not necessarily prevent them from working a consistent 40-hour work week in the national economy of work. So we have to look at that. So the adult standard also shows an inability to perform any kind of job that exists in substantial numbers in the national or local economy, any kind. And basically looking at they have to show that they meet the basic standards of even sedentary work on a sustained basis, meaning that they can't do that 40-hour weeks even in a sit-down position um, on a job. Also that they're unable to meet the basic mental demands of simple, unskilled work. So those are two things that they're going to be looking at that young person when they're transitioning from the child standard to the adult standard. 
So what are they gonna be looking for? And this is where it's important because you got, your clients are basically gonna have the stuff coming up. So they're looking at all medical, all vocational, all educational resources. These things can come from practitioners, including doctors, nurses, physician assistants, naturopaths, uh, chiropractors, therapists, psychiatrists, social, psychiatric work, social workers. Those things is with social security, you have to, it's like Missouri, you gotta show me. So it's, it's one thing that you understand the level of that individual's disability is a whole nother level to show documentation of what's going on with that individual. And if you don't have it, it's, it's, it isn't, it's not as persuasive. So that's the other thing that you always have to look for, especially when they go through that redetermination process, you know, making sure that they have that. So basically not having recent records of medical treatment or vocational services or education may result in that finding that an individual no longer meets the standards of being an a, a, a SSI recipient, that they don't consider them disabled any longer. So what do you do in the meantime? We make sure we, they see the doctors and the other health professionals because we need that, that trail, that paper trail. We're also going to make sure that they uh, attend and participate in appropriate education and vocational training especially if there's no recommended treatment of that disabling condition. We have, you have to have recent records. And then you gotta provide Social Security with access to all of those records and reports. And I, in my former life, I used to be what they call a claims rep, meaning that I was an attorney and I would represent individuals in front of Social Security, in front of the administrative law judges, and basically are arguing for the half of the individual with the disability, saying, hey, this individual can no longer work or they can't work, and this is why. And if you don't have that stuff in front of a judge or the, the disability determination services when they're looking at it, it is not easy. Um, so what the thing is, is that you want them to have access. And one of the things I would notice, at least in my experience, was Social Security would provide that information or make that request, but unfortunately the care, uh, the care person would not always submit all the information. And it's so much as you may have to go back and look at the record itself of that individual to see what's missing. I've done that, and that makes the difference sometimes because it's like, wait a minute. This person was in the hospital. What happened? You know, and they never had the hospital records, or what, whatever significant event or whatever happened, and it, it's not even in the file. And it's not Social Security's fault. They made the request. It was just they never got the paperwork. Okay. So basically, in regards to childhood determination, they basically looking at this is SSR 09-2P, and this is talking about young adults with their this is a Social Security rule. Um, dealing with the regulation regarding um, discussion of documenting childhood disability through IEPs. So in the past, they would not look at IEPs anymore once a person turned 18. At, in 2009, they started looking at it. So that's the other thing about updating these IEPs with the school. That's supposed to be done annually and also when they have a significant change. And if it's not done, it doesn't give the, the, the picture of what that student needs are. So it's not just on the school level where they're supposed to have the educational services and the things and, and, and the um, related services and things that they need in order to have that specially designed instruction so they can be successful in school. It also gives and paint a portrait of what their needs are. And that's very important when you do those IEP meetings or you attend the IEP meetings and so that they is understood by all parties that are sitting at that table that those things need to be documented. Even if you get the printed part afterwards, make sure that it's listed in there because sometimes it's not always listed. Some of the things you discussed is not always listed. And sometimes I have to go back and say, hey, 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 we talked about this, put it in there because it's important. Okay, so we basically have um, at Social Security Rule 11-P um, and they're talking about evaluating um, disability in young adults and they look at that and they use the same criteria. But they're gonna also look at non-medical sources social workers, therapists, vocational co uh, coaches, so you have a job coach or something like that, family members, the VR counselor, whatever it is, they're gonna also look at those documentation. So, warning, SSI, basically if you lose that, if they consider them no longer disabled, they can lose Medicaid. They can also lose Medicaid waiver services, so if they're getting services through APD, that can be problematic. Also, they could be losing the developmentally disabled waiver. Um, also warning, um, living arrangements and food provided by family could be considered in-kind income and it could affect SSI eligibility. So you always got to look at certain things, even if it's not money exchanging hands, 
Um, you also got to look at those things to see in regards to financial eligibility. All right, so we have David. He's 19 years old. He still attends high school. He is, has an intellectual disability with a full-scale IQ of 65. What documentation would you use to determine he is still eligible for Social Security benefits? IEPs, what else? Neuropsychologicals, what else? Come on, quit. don't be shy. I won't bite, I promise. <laughs> Let's, what about the doctor's records, uh, medical records? Um, if they have any um, notes from his job coach or notes from his vocational rehabilitation um, counselor, uh, looking at um, situation from employers even. Um, those type of things we're gonna be looking at in regards to providing a fuller picture of that individual and their capability and what they can and cannot do. Okay, continued benefits. So finding that a person is no longer disabled um, under these continued benefits, under Section 301, it allows an SSI beneficiary to continue to receive SSI benefits, including Medicaid. So SSI benefits may be protected when a youth participates in a vocational rehabilitation program. See why I'm pushing a vocational rehabilitation program? <laughs> Not just to teach the individual, but also while they're trying to do this, you know, you're helping them um, be able to, to feel it out. Um, so we're looking at ticket to work program, an IPE. We're looking at a past plan if they want to start their own business. We're looking at the I IEPs, and we're looking at that in regards to them getting Section 301 protection. So what happens is, and I've, I did have a case like this before, where the individual is working on community-based instruction through the school, and um, somebody reviewed his file for continuing disability review, and they were like, um, he's working. And I was like, no. <laughs> he was getting community-based instruction. He was learning how to work, and they didn't understand that, and I had to basically let them know this distinguish the difference. Um, they weren't receiving any pay, but even with Social Security, even if you're not getting paid, they can consider some type of uh, activities work, even if it's not financially beneficial. Um, protected Medicaid. So we're looking at that situation where um, Cash benefits, if they're lost because of the childhood disability benefit, this is what they call, um, they formally called it DAC, Disability Adult Child. What this basically is, is, uh, we'll go into it, um, somebody who's 18 years old, age older, or they've been found, and they've been found disabled before age 22, and post those, that, that age 22 is important with Social Security. So that makes the difference in between somebody being able to be eligible for this particular program. Their parent is disabled, retired, or deceased. They're insured under Social Security, meaning they're getting SSDI or retirement benefits. They filed an application for child benefits and they're unmarried. So what happens is they be able to qualify not for SSI, but they get SSDI based on their parent's record. Okay, and the unmarried part, you have to be unmarried. I did have a client that happened to one time, she got married and she didn't know about that criteria and she was trying to appeal and I was like, uh, but you, ma you got married. Now, um, if you marry another social security beneficiary, you can keep your benefits, but if you marry someone who is it, you lose them. Not my rule, but that's what it is. You have to be over 18 and you have a blindness or a disability that begins before age 22. That's the magic number. If you wait until after age 22, or they don't, we can't have a proof that it occurred before age 22, then they won't qualify. Um, to be eligible for Title II benefits on a parent's record due to disability, retirement, or death of parent, they're going to lose, lose SSI due to either receipt of that benefit or increase. So this is where that um, protected Medicaid comes in, because once you get qualify for the SSDI, it may be more money than the SSI and you'll lose SSI. So you can't have both. Um, well, let me take that back. You can have both if there's lower amounts that are under uh, the SSI amount. Um, it, how could I put it? In regards to the top amount for SSI, that's the top amount. So if somebody is getting a significantly less amount on the SSDI, so if you're looking at 700, we use last year's amount, $731, 
right? And you're getting $500 in SSDI, that's a gap for $231. So you can still get $231 in SSI benefits while you're getting that $500 in SSI. But if you're getting $1,000 in SSDI benefits, that's over the $731, and that disqualifies you for reason, receiving SSI benefits. So what happens is you may lose your Medicaid. So what we try to do is go in and, and basically have protected Medicaid, and this is the eligibility for that. So what happens is, is that we look at that and basically have that eligibility and look at that in order for them to protect their Medicaid benefits. All righty. 1619B while you're working. So if you earn enough income, you can become ineligible for SSI, but you can still maintain Medicaid health benefits. So if you do that, uh, it protects an individual for reinstatement of SSI benefits uh, should you, your countable income decline. And it also protects eligibility under the waiver programs. So if somebody's still working and receiving you know, certain waiver program, um, this can make the difference between them being able to continue to stay in a group home or not. So we're looking at that, and for all them to be eligible, they have to have a disability. They gotta meet all SSI's eligibility requirements. Um, they have to receive SSI for that previous month of the eligibility period. They have to need Medicaid and would not have earnings that will replace that SSI benefit. Okay, you guys already know about the extended foster care program, um, but basically they have a choice to stay in foster care that gives them the options. Um, and basically they are diagnosed with a disability and basically they can attend high school to GED, they can get enrolled in the College of Vocational Rehabilitation Program or educa Vocational Education Program. Um, they can be employed for 80 hours per month, participate in a program that prevents or promotes barriers, promotes or eliminate barriers to employment, uh, and have a diagnosed and di uh, documented disability. They'll prevent them from participating in any of those activities above. So what do you do with your clients in this transition age? We plan early. We have a transition. We start going to those IEP meetings or whoever goes to the IEP meetings and we look at those and tell them at 14, we need VR to be at the table or DBS to be at the table. We apply to VR or DBS 14. We invite that a representative from that VR to come to the IEP meetings. You, sometimes you got a hint to the school, well more than a hint to the school, say, hey, we need VR here. So we want them at that table. Um, apply for any available services, scholarships, waiver programs, VR services, RTI, whatever we can do. And we keep a, a watchful eye and seek assistance in regards to the income and benefit issues. So we're gonna contact that WIPA. You're gonna contact us if you have questions. Um, like I said, Natalie is a phenomenal resource. We also have uh, Mr. Victor Penoff, who is a phenomenal resource. Uh, and, and basically, we'll be able to you know, basically, if it's a situation we could possibly help you with, we probably kind of, you know, help you with WIPA, uh, uh, to contact WIPA, but basically you got to look at that because uh, you want to see what happens. Um, you're going to seek assistance in order to avoid that overpayment because those can be very extensive. Um, continue making sure that clients see their doctors to understand their disabling conditions. You want those documentations. Determine if that individual youth can handle their own social security and health benefits. And if not, let's see who we can get to help. And we got something like that later on. Natalie and I are presenting on how to become a social security representative payee <laughs> later on this afternoon. But basically we're, we're going into that if that's a situation that if that individual would not be able to handle their benefits. Um, we also uh, identify accommodations for the youth, what they need in employment or if they want to you know, participate in post-secondary, how do you go about doing it? And remember that earning wages cause SSI benefits to decrease, but it increases overall income, and it puts them on a path of being an insured worker. So that can make all the difference in the world in regards to later on in life if they needed um, benefits and what that incurs. So we advocate for the rights of uh, and the needs of people with disabilities, both on, for vocational rehabilitation agencies, the Division of Blind Services, as well as vocational rehabilitation if you need us. And we also deal with um, employment discrimination, reasonable accommodation, work-related transportation, 
um, assistance with centers of independent living, social security work incentives and WIPAs, employment networks, and other barriers to employment. All right, are there any questions? I know I threw a lot of information at you, but yes. Okay, let me make sure I'm understanding it. You're saying that you're, you have an a, a individual and they're trying to get employment. Okay, so they were told they're not able to get regular employment. With SSI, it's basically, it depends, okay, let me go back. So in regards to that, we're looking at if an individual has the ability to sustain 40 hour a week employment in a competitive work environment. So you're saying that this individual uh, receive something saying that they can't do that? Correct. If In order for them to be eligible for any kind of Social Security disability, they have to show that their disability meets or equals one of the Social Security's listings or basically where they have a situation where they um, have what they call were they unable to sustain either sedentary work, uh, sedentary work level, or unable to meet or equal the demands of simple, unskilled work? So those two things in combination, you know, basically they look at the totality of everything, but they could decide, they could decide whether or not that individual is not uh, dis uh, eligible to, for competitive work and consider, be considered disabled. Yes. But here's, that's where VR can assist. A VR can assist in a lot of different areas. VR can assist in regards to training. VR can assist in regards to if they need a job coach, that they have a one-on-one -on -one person to kind of show them the essential functions of the job so they know how to do it. Um, if they needed uh, education, or if they needed uh, certain devices, or if they needed certain counseling, or whatever that may be, that is one of the incentives that they have in order to assist individuals who may not have that situation. Without any assistance training or work, they may not be able to work, but maybe with that assistance with vocational rehabilitation, they may be able to find some type of work they can do in a competitive environment. Yes? I was just, I was just gonna add to that. You have to think about the substantial gainful activity level. Yes. So, so that's that $1,220. So when they're applying for SSI, that's when they're, when they're saying you can't work, they're saying you can't work above that level. So, so even if you're, if, even if I'm out there and I'm working and I'm earning, let's say a thousand dollars a month and that's the most I can do, I can still be eligible for SSI. Uh, it, it, as long as all of the medical documentation is saying that's the most I can do at that time when I'm applying. Yeah, so it's both the medical and the financial. Yes. in October and he's had two hip replacement surgeries and he also has an amputated foot and a low IQ. I was told that I couldn't apply for Social Security benefits for him that his case manager had to do that and she so far has not done that. So what can I do to advocate for him? I did get him in touch with ER. Okay, services. goodness. Um, how we could kind of take that offline because I don't want to get too personal because I don't know how you, who you are and related to that individual. Okay, you his guardian, so you can. You have the, huh? Guardian ad litem, oh, okay, 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 okay. Uh, we'll take that offline because that's gonna be complicated. I just want to make sure that I want to give you the right information in regards to where you are related to that individual because if that caseworker hasn't applied, there may be something that somebody else needs to know um, because if he's closing in on 18, you know, there's some things that need to be put in place, especially when they're going through that transitional period. Okay? So if you can, like, give us a minute afterwards, I'll be more than happy to talk to you. Okay. Yes? What safeguards are in place to make sure that the individual or the child receives the benefits and the parents don't use that money to go out and pay by the car? 
Uh, good question. If they're the representative payee for that individual, <laughs> Hey, how you doing? Um, so one of the things that we have, we are, Natalie and I, um, I, I'm the director and Natalie is the program coordinator for Rep Pay E program. And what we've been actually contracted to do by Social Security is go throughout the state and actually go into APD group homes, ALFs, individuals' homes, and we're actually going through bank statements, ledgers, receipts to see where is this money being spent and how is it being sent and is it spent on behalf of the beneficiary properly so yes we are <laughs> trust me that's our whole month <laughs> yes let us know yes because we can we can basically um inform um social security of the issue um, we do have a dictated form that we have to use, but if we can get that information from you, if you want to contact us, we will submit that to Social Security, and if they uh, grant it, we could go and actually go out and look and see the bank statements and the ledgers and, and you know, receipts and everything to see where that money is and report it to Social Security about what's happening in more detail. Excuse me? I, I, I couldn't. Yeah, if the new Cadillac on the front lawn and the bank statement shows the check went out or the receipts, you know, it's like, hey, where's the money? Um, we've seen some pretty interesting things so far. Uh, we've been doing a lot of these around the state. We have a team of approximately uh, 12 of us running around the state, and we've been going everywhere. And you'll be surprised what is going on in regards to some of the financial situations. And, and it, it gets really interesting in regards to the personalities. It's like, hey, you know. And we're reporting it all to Social Security, so we, you know, we'll see what happens from there. Okay. Yes. it over to the supervisor in that case manager because a lot of our case managers are just overwhelmed mm -hmm. so to think about filling out another application is a lot when they have over full plates already so the way that we have helped is we've actually filled out those applications for APD Social Security other benefits sent it over through your child advocate manager to her supervisor and case manager so that's some practical advice yeah. on how to assist the system Give them one less thing to do, take it off their plate, and go forth. Yeah, that, that, that's, a good, that's a good idea. Thank you. Is there, are there local bridges for communication between Children's Home Society who administers the extended foster care program and the transition uh, for children in foster care and Social Security? And what can a guardian ad litem do to facilitate that communication? Hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> um, in that regard, I, I'm not sure about Children's Home Society. Uh, we get a prescribed list in regards to where we look at and do. Um, but if that's a situation where we can possibly take it back, and see if we can uh, see if we can do that, and, and because especially with transition age students, is this something we can have a discussion as an agency? I think that we can do that. I mean, we could discuss it. I mean, I can't promise because it's going to be above my pay grade, but I think that it'll be something that we can do in regards to trying to have that discussion to see if that's something like you said, a bridge. Okay. Yes. No, an SSI recipient can't have a rep payee. They can have a rep payee, uh, or they can be their own rep payee. It just depends on what Social Security feels that deeming that they could be able to handle their own money. And if Social Security feels like they, they can't handle their own money, they will request somebody to assist them with that process. So they will ask for them to become, get a rep payee or suggest a rep payee uh, or something in that light. Um, psychologically, they usually have like a medical documentation. Of, of, they ask the doctors, the person's doctors or psychologists or something, or they also look at you know, the IEP, uh, see what the functionality of that individual is, and then they make a determination of whether or not that person could be able to handle their own funds. Um, sometimes it's also other things like chemical substance abuse or something like that. They also have that instance as well. Um, it just depends. Yes. I 
was told that um, we were going to have to use ILS services. What is the similarities or the difference then between, they said no to vocational rehab, flat out no, because we have Camelot and we're going to bring in their representatives with the independent living services that they offer. Why would they tell you no I, I, when it's, it, they're, it's, it's a... I'm, so I'm asking you. <laughs> Um, a court, if the individual is still in public school? No, I mean, this is already a couple of years ago, but because I had, I had done an online training and I had learned about the vocational rehab. Mm -hmm. So, of course, at the next meeting that we had, I, I brought this up and they said, no, we use ILS. We can, you can use VR. I mean, you that's use what both. they're there for. That's their purpose. That's their whole purpose. So you can use both. You can have both people, both agencies. I mean, I don't see why not. I don't see why not, because I mean that's VR's purpose. So if you know if if they can work in concert, fine. If they can figure out who's going to do it the best, that works as well. But you know, as many people we get to the table to be productive for that individual, that's what we need. No, it's um, it's independent living services. It's it's, an it's a seal. That when yeah, when the child is aging out, they. He has a seal. Yeah, yeah, independent living. So they, they have a case they manager. Be, and they can be serving as an employment network. And if they're serving as an employment network and they're assigning the tickets, that's why they're telling you not to the VR. Because by doing that, they can go on the incentive of going back to work. And it really comes down to the beneficiary's choice. So when you're talking about whoever is being served, it's their choice whether they're going to be served by an employment network. So there are options. Okay, anything else? Any other questions? Okay, everyone sure? Are we all cool? Are we all Fonzies? Hey, okay. <laughs> I, may be, I may be dating myself here. <laughs> Thank you so much for being a wonderful audience.